All right, good evening, everybody. Go ahead and open up to the book of Acts, because if that's some kind of surprise or shock, right? Uh, we are going to be in chapter 26 tonight. And the last couple weeks, we haven't really reviewed our maps. I keep sticking them in there to keep just kind of making your brain look at them, so hopefully we recall what these things look like, because if we try to, to review and remember it all, we could, we'd be here all night on review. And I know Brian thinks I kind of already do that already, but uh, but it is it's good to review and it's fun. But we will definitely be reviewing, which will be the good thing as we continue in our next study and we go through church history. Uh, it's going to start with a good review of the book of Acts, so we'll kind of hopefully retain a little bit more going into that. But just to recall that we've seen three mission journeys, as I flip through our maps here, we've seen three mission journeys by Paul, and we know that there's been other mission journeys going on. Uh, right in the narrative that we see, remember, we're following this main character, Paul. And really, in the beginning of Acts, it wasn't even Paul, right? Who was really the main character in the beginning? Peter. Peter, right? And Mark was one. There's been several. But Peter was really the focal point at the beginning. And he and John are there preaching at Pentecost, you know, and he preaches later. And 3,000 are saved, 5,000 are saved. And it's primarily the Jews. So we saw that transition from kind of Peter and the Jews to Paul and the Gentiles. And that's really where we've been. So it's not like Peter and the Jews are not existent anymore or something. You know, it's just we're following this path. And remember that, like you mentioned, Mark and Luke and, uh, you know, just on and on and on with the names of people. Jason, you know what I mean? And people's names that we've seen uh, of disciples and followers of Christ that are just being spread all, all throughout, you know, the known world to, to spread the gospel. And remember, what was the primary avenue that God used to do that? was persecution, right? So the per persecution of the church is what spread them out and uh, and got them to, to go and to spread the gospel into all the areas. And so we follow a man who was instrumental in that. Remember from Jerusalem when he was Saul and was unconverted, and he, he was kind of the, the, the head spokesman for all that, and the you know, the, the prime headhunter and wanting to persecute and put, put them in prison and, and kill them and all those things. And we'll see that again in his testimony tonight. But when we finish up the third mission journey, remember now the time frame uh, is about 57 AD. Okay, so to, to recall things, Paul was born in about 5 AD. He was saved in about 34 AD. And so now we are about... 57 in chapter 21 when he reaches Jerusalem after the third missionary journey. So it's been a good little time, you know, what is that, 23 years-ish uh, that he's been converted, that he's been saved. And so he's early 50s, 52, 53 years old. Um, so put that all in context to remember where we are and what we're doing. So now we have seen, though, that when he got to Jerusalem, the Jews accuse him he is given his testimony, remember, in chapter 22, as he's being taken outside the city to be stoned and he's being beaten. Uh, the Roman commander comes in, uh, Claudius Lysias, and saves him from being pummeled to death and takes him up. And as he's walking up the stairs um, outside the, the temple courtyard, he is allowed to speak to the Jews. And remember, he gives a testimony of who he is and then he goes to Christ and that's when they all start wanting to kill him again. And so... That's chapter 22. Then the next chapter, 23, he takes them the next day before the council. Remember, he goes before the Sanhedrin. And he throws the bomb out there about the resurrection and lets them all go crazy. So uh, Lysias saves him from that again. Chapter 23, now we move on to uh, being tried in uh, Caesarea by the governor, which is Governor Felix at the time. Remember that? So... Um, He's kind of moving on and going through this process, which takes a while, because remember what happened with Felix, is Felix refused to hear the case and left him in custody or left him in detainment for two years, remember, until the next governor, Festus, came into power. So now we've actually gone forward two more years. So where we are tonight, we're already in about 59, almost 60 A.D., okay? So we're about 59 A.D. He has uh, gone now chapter 25. Last week, we saw the new governor, Felix, uh, excuse me, the old governor, Felix, is gone. And now the new governor, Festus, has arrived and come on the scene. And he has heard Paul's defense. He finds nothing wrong with him. But yet King Agrippa and his wife slash sister, remember Bernice, come. 
and uh, they want to hear, Agrippa wants to hear what Paul has to say, and so we finished out last week on chapter 25 with Festus saying, okay, well, you will hear him tomorrow, and then we saw Agrippa and Bernice come in, remember, said with great pomp, and they were ready to hear him, and that's what we are going to lead into tonight in chapter 26. So that's the context, that's where we are. And uh, again, about 59 A.D. or so, and that's where we're going to pick up the story. Uh, chapter 26, follow along with me in verse 1. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life as from a youth, uh, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. What was his own nation? Anybody remember? Where is he from? Rome. Tarsus. Good, good. Tarsus, which was in Cilicia. Okay? Uh, verse 5. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it, though, incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I thought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. And not only did I lock them up, many of the saints, into prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them oftentimes in the synagogues, and tried uh, to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even into foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. And at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me to those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Verse 15. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. But rise and stand to your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things which you have seen uh, of me and to those things which I will appear to you, delivering you from people and from the Gentiles. Your people, I should say, or some versions say the Jewish people, and from the Gentiles. To whom am I am sending you? To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds and keeping with their repentance, for this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have the help that comes from God. Amen to that. And so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my man, mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. Verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time you would persuade me to be a Christian. And Paul said, whether short or long, I would that God would not only to you, but also to all who hear me this day might be such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, and all those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free 
if he had not appealed to Caesar. Mm. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We again ask that you would uh, enlighten us, uh, Lord, with your truth, and teach us tonight and grow us tonight in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. All right. So this journey, again, has it's been a, a good little journey. We've seen a, a process here for Paul. Uh, and there's the, the Cliff Notes version of it there. Chapter 22, we've seen him giving his testimony, his defense uh, to the Jews. Chapter 23, we saw him before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, giving his defense. We then saw him in chapter 24 before Felix, the governor. Then in 25, the next governor, two years later, of Festus. And now in chapter 26, we see him before King Agrippa. Uh, and remember, Luke is being very intentional about recording all this. So that we see, A, I think, that Paul is being found guilty of nothing, right? By any of these people. Uh, the Jews want to obviously condemn him because they hate him, and they hate Jesus, and they hate the way, and this whole sect, and this movement uh, that they want to extinguish. But in reality, they don't even have grounds. I mean, they're falsely accusing him of, remember, uh, defiling the temple and bringing a gentile into the courtyard of the temple which he did not do uh so they're just trying to get him on anything they can but unfortunately for them and fortunately for paul because of god's sovereignty every single roman official that he is being under and being before finds absolutely nothing wrong with what he's doing okay so we're going to continue to see that and again we've seen a two-year time span here now of, of his detainment and of his waiting. And, and now all that has happened, and he still has to go travel to Rome to go before Caesar. Because remember, his right as a Roman citizen is that he can do that. And he did, in fact, do that. And so now, even though they're hearing him here, remember this was kind of a mock trial, for lack of a better word uh, at the moment. But it's not really anything that's going to come to fruition here as far as sentencing or anything because Agrippa is just hearing him because it's a liberty that's been granted to him by Festus. Uh, so no matter what, you know, uh, the, the people here who are with him or what King Agrippa says is going to influence anything. Festus has already decided he's going to Caesar because he appealed to Caesar and that's his right. So that's where he's going. Okay, so uh, this is just, again, another platform that we see God produce for Paul to witness to King Agrippa and to the governor of Festus. And in this whole journey, uh, we talked about this in Sunday school a couple times, that to get to Rome is what Paul wanted to do. Okay, we see him write that, that he wanted to go to Rome. And God told him, remember, you are going to Rome. And so he probably didn't think this was the way he was going to go to Rome with the gospel. But God used this avenue of the detainment and the imprisonments and things to go and to get the gospel taken to Rome. And in fact, all the way to Nero, right? All the way to Caesar, to the governors that are leaving, to the new governors, and to Caesar uh, himself, and to the, the guards that he is chained to all the time. I mean, Paul's just a, a testimony on and on and on and on everywhere he goes, okay? So he again makes his defense here as we see Agrippa say, you are allowed to speak for yourself um, in verse 1. So he gives him the liberty, tell me the story, what's going on. And now we see a few things here. Verse 2, he says, I consider myself fortunate to make my defense before you, Agrippa, because you are an expert in all customs and questions of the Jews. So this sounds pretty familiar. Uh, to us, right? This sounds very similar to, you know, the the intro that he gave in chapter 24, um, you know, to Felix. Remember, Festus is the governor now, but he is new to the area. Remember what he did when he first got there? He went to Jerusalem to see the city and to right. get to know it because he's not familiar with Jewish ways and customs. And, and uh, the ESV, if you heard it when I read it, says controversies, <laughs> the customs and the controversies of the Jews. So Felix, the prior governor, was, and remember Paul said, I'm glad to, for you to hear me because you know these things. Uh, so he says the same thing to Agrippa because last week we unpacked that a, a great deal, uh, you know, about Agrippa being a Herod and, and would be familiar with these things. Okay, so uh, being a Herod, again, he would be an expert in these things. And I want you to know this too. It's not like he would have a, just a common, you know, fly-by knowledge of this. 
remember who his his family heritage is and who they are uh, they they well know all the things and the customs of the Jews also he would have been the overseer and would have been in charge of the temple and the treasury as the king of the Jews as the king of Israel he in fact would have put in place the high priests okay so uh, he has the power over all these Jewish things now remember he's still under the thumb of the Roman governor and the Roman commanders and the Roman authority but he does have some sense of authority over Israel and over the Jews and over the chief priests and the temple and all those things. Okay, so um, I do have the, in the notes here just uh, because I already prepared this a couple weeks out. I know we talked about it a little bit last week, but remember who the Herods are. Um, this is King Herod Agrippa, but it's really Agrippa II. Okay. It's uh, the son of King Herod Agrippa. So we start in the beginning of Matthew chapter 2. Remember King Herod the Great. You guys should have this down now. King Herod the Great is the one that tried to kill Jesus when he was born in Matthew 2. And he killed all the two-year-old and under uh, males in the area around uh, Bethlehem. Then his son was the next Herod, the next king. His name was Antipas. And he is the one that we find later in Matthew 14 that puts John the Baptist into prison, and he later ends up killing John the Baptist. Then Herod's grandson, okay, is next, which is King Agrippa. Agrippa was the one who was in chapter 12 of Acts that we talked about. I know it's been several months now, but he was the one that killed the apostle James and had Peter put in prison. And remember, the angel of the Lord came and released Peter from prison, but James was killed by Agrippa. So this King Herod that we are talking about tonight is Agrippa II, which is that man's son, okay? Um, so his great-granddaddy, his granddaddy, and his daddy were all evil, wicked Herods, and, uh, and that's who this is, who is now listening to Paul uh, preach the gospel to him, talk about the prophets and Moses and, and all those things we'll get to later here in the, in the chapter. Uh, but that's who we are talking about, okay? Some very cool significance. I know I let the cat out of the bag a few weeks ago, but maybe we've forgotten by then. And some of you might not have, have caught it or been here. But church history shows us a couple things here um, that are very intriguing. Because remember where we are in our time frame now. We are in about 59 AD. Okay? So what's going to happen in about 10 years? 70 AD destruction of the temple titus and the roman army is going to come in and destroy the temple okay in the city and burn it so we're about 10 years out from that okay so not far uh church history tells us that there was a church we know because who was there james uh the brother of, of jesus not the dead apostle james but james and peter and john and all the apostles were in the church. Remember in chapter 15, they, uh, Paul went down there to talk to them because he kept giving reports back to them. So we know that there was a church of believers in Jerusalem. So the question begs, what happened in 70 AD to the church when they came and destroyed the temple and burned the city down? Okay, so when you go back and you look, this is not uh, a biblical account. This is early church writings Josephus and other uh, early historians, Christian historians, that say uh, when this happened, okay, uh, that the church was actually warned, that the church in Jerusalem was warned that, that some of them received visions from the Lord talking about uh, what was going to happen and the, of the impending judgment that was coming the, uh, by the Romans and, and all of the destruction of the, the city and the things that were going to happen. And this church from Jerusalem fled to Pella. Um, in a nearby district and the the irony is and why we're talking about it tonight is that that city of Pella was under the jurisdiction of Agrippa the second this man right here that Paul preaches in front of okay that's who uh, was there and he allowed them safe passage and allowed them safe living to stay where he was in his city okay so Think what we may, whether he was saved or he wasn't, I don't know that. We don't know that. The point is, God influenced him and used him, just as God's using all these 
Roman guys to save Paul's neck to get him to where he wants Paul to go. Again, God's sovereign hands orchestrating everything. He also uses this King Agrippa II, this Herod, mind you. You know what I mean? So if we, we thought, you know, Paul was maybe the last guy that would ever be saved. You know what I mean? Like, man, if, if Paul could be saved, like, anybody could be saved. Dude, this is the last bloodline that you would think God would use, uh, being these Herods. Okay? Uh, in fact, you would, you would argue, I would argue the other side. That Satan used the Herods, in fact, because he tried to kill baby Jesus off at the beginning with the Herods and knocked the whole thing off. So uh, now we're going to see that God, in this in this case, used King Herod uh, to to allow his church safe passage from Jerusalem and out of the destruction, uh, you know, destroying that church there in Jerusalem. Yes, sir. I think it's pretty cool. Now, all all of this high priest and so on find nothing wrong with Paul and at the end of 26 Agrippa and Festus agree right. that there's no charges against Paul now my thing is when you put him in a ship to Rome to go in front of appeal his case to Caesar under what charges is he going to Rome if all these people cannot write a report and say this guy is a murderer or whatever, right? As a Roman citizen. Good. Good. Just the record that they're going to be sending, like you said, they're going right. to send. And obviously, these we're going to find another commander. Julius is going to be assigned to Paul and take him on that journey on the yeah. ship and all that. We'll talk about next chapter. Uh, that'll be on you next week. <laughs> um, so, uh, so do your homework. There's a lot of there's a lot of crazy stuff next week. <laughs> Um, Sam, be ready. So, uh, yeah, no, it's a great call. It's definitely a great call. So this Agrippa, uh, well, we'll get to it. I don't want to. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's go back to it. So he's he's. Greg, if you look yes, back, sir. All the way back to Genesis, God has always used a lot of imperfect people. For yep. Yep, even non-believers. Yeah. Yep. I mean, he uses who he wants. That's the whole point of God's sovereignty. It doesn't matter um, who you are and what you think you are. You know what I mean? God's going God's gonna to accomplish his will in exactly the way that he wants to accomplish it. And so uh, we know that. That he uses believers, yes, of, certainly. Uh, but he also manipulates whatever he wants to fit into his will. And he will use non-believers as, as well. Uh, you know. Pharaoh, uh, Cyrus, Darius, all through the time of Daniel. I mean, just on and on and on we could go and, and prove that, show that. So right here we're seeing him do another one. And the, and the fact that he is bringing Paul to be kind of a, a representative, which is what an apostle is. Okay, he's a representative of Christ. Uh, but he's Paul's being a representative now of the church. And Agrippa is not getting a bad taste from Paul. You'll see, we'll see next week too, that all these guys are actually getting a good taste of Paul. They all like him. They're protecting him from the Jews. And, and they're listening to him going like, the Jews are the, the ones in the wrong here, not him. And look at his demeanor and look at how he, he is and how humble he is and his patience. They're growing to, to understand that, man, maybe there's nothing really bad about this Christian thing. Uh, and, and in light of that, Agrippa ends up helping the church later on. Okay, so um, good, just a, a very good, very valid point. Because so he goes further to say, all the Jews know my manner of life from my youth up. So here's the Jews. Here he's given his defenses. Like they all know me for a long time. They knew me from when I was in Tarsus. They knew me certainly when I was in Jerusalem. Uh, that I was a Pharisee of the strictest sect of our religion. Uh, which we know is true. You know, knowing anything about Paul, uh, we know that he was a diehard in, in everything that he does. You can imagine that he was, as he said, a Pharisee of Pharisees, okay? Um, and, and very zealous for the law and zealous for God. He says, Now I stand before you for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. What is that talking about? Because we've been talking about a couple different things last couple months last couple of weeks uh it says the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain what is this promise he is speaking of that was made to the 12 tribes and made to our fathers and who would our fathers be who's he referring to in Abraham. our fathers 
Good. Abraham. Who else? The patriarchs. Who are they? David. Abraham, Isaac, Isaac Jacob. Jacob. Okay. And the twelve and the twelve of, of Jacob, right? Good. So, what would the promise be to them that he's referring to? Messiah. Yeah. The promise, even all the way back to Genesis three. Okay. Uh, the pom promise to Adam and Eve and to all mankind of this Messiah to come that they've been looking for in prophecies for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, these Jews in this time of that generation. And so he is saying that I'm standing before you because of that hope and because of that promise that they all uh, have hope in as well. Look, don't the Jews that are accusing him have the hope in the same promise? They yeah. believe in a Messiah coming. They right? Just, they're still looking they for it. Yeah, believe they it. believe in that Messiah. And so what Paul's saying is for this hope, I am being accused by the Jews. Well, why would the Jews be accusing him? Because what's the problem? The problem is they do agree on the same sense of the Messiah, the Messianic promise, but they don't agree with Paul that Jesus is the fulfillment the of that prophecy and of, those, of that promise. Okay, so the fulfillment of this promise through Jesus and his resurrection is what Paul is saying I'm on trial for right now because that is the promise and Jesus has fulfilled it. And then he goes on to say, why do you find it incredible that God raises the dead? He's like, if you believe the promises, you believe the things that happen in, in the, the Old Testament and in our history, why do you find it so difficult and impossible and incredible uh, for God to raise the dead? I mean, he's God. He does what he wants to do. Uh, let me just finish this one yeah. thought. That he's going to point to and try to point in the direction, which he constantly does, that the resurrection itself is the validation of Jesus being the Messiah, which it is. That's the whole point of the resurrection is we get the life from that. He's resurrected from the dead. He's not a God. Remember what he said. He's not a God of the dead, but he is, in fact, what? A God of the living. Okay? He is alive. He has been resurrected. We were there. Remember, there's still people that are here in this generation that were alive at the time of, of Christ. Okay? Remember, we're only about, what, 59? We're only like 30 years from when Christ ascended. Okay? So there's people that were there. And the, and the people that saw him alive after he was crucified, after he was in the tomb. And he's saying the validation. And I'm saying the validation of the resurrection, excuse me, the validation is the resurrection uh, that, that Christ was was raised from the dead. That is the, the validation that he is the fulfillment of the promise. Do you understand? Did you have mm -hmm. a thought there? Yeah, were, were there any resurrections on the Old Testament? No, right? Everything happened in the new, right? I mean... Yes and no. <laughs> um, that's I mean, a that, great question. No, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me clarify that. He is the first to be resurrected and stay resurrected. He is the first resurrected body. Oh, oh, uh, because, nice. yes, we know in the Old Testament that Elijah and Elisha both raised people from the dead. Um, you know, yeah. even even Jesus uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. He Before also he raised died, a woman's right? gotcha, gotcha. Uh, child from the dead from in the, in the, in the box. Uh, but so people did raise from the dead. And in fact, when Jesus um, was killed on the cross, bodies of the saints come out from the grave and came to life. But what's the difference between all those and Jesus' resurrection? They all died again. Right. Right. Lazarus died again. He's buried somewhere. Okay? So were all the other ones that were dead and came back to life. They died again, and they still had corruptible mortal bodies until they died again. Uh, Jesus is resurrected and has ascended and is, for, is sitting now at the right hand of the Father uh, and is forever alive. So they believed in the resurrection because it was it was written That's in the right. Old Testament. That's they right. didn't believe that. Except Christ. for who? One of them would not. Right. This one Sadducees. sect of them Sadducees. wouldn't, and who was that? Sadducees. 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 Right. So, Sadducees. but yes, the Pharisees believed yes. The Sadducees believed no resurrection at all. Even even if there were Jews. And it's written down. Yeah, they the just old... didn't believe in that. No ghosts, no resurrection, and all that. That was that bomb that remember that he threw out in the thing. Yes, sir. Um, now the resurrection that they did not believe in. Did they not believe that the soul was resurrected, but the body stayed here, or were they are they talking about a physical? Yeah, like, they would believe. No, there's no body where Jesus. 
but oh, they would have different years. beliefs. Some of them would believe, yeah, that the soul would go, but you don't get a body. You know what I mean? They would all have a little bit different nuances to their beliefs. Uh, but what Paul's clearly stating, especially he's stating he's a Pharisee, the Pharisees we know believed in the resurrection, that there would be a bodily resurrection, and that the Messiah would be the first one to be resurrected. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, that is the resurrection chapter, and you will find there that Paul says that there is an order to the resurrection, and it says Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, and then it says uh, those who are his at his coming, and then again at the end. Uh, so showing the order is the first one, the first fruits, uh, is Christ, and he's the first one that resurrected. And in fact, when we go back to recall our Matthew study uh, last year, while we went through that, Jesus fulfilled those um, feasts and festivals, the Jewish feasts and festivals, in his death and burial and resurrection. He died on Passover, and then he was in the tomb for three days, uh, during unleavened bread, and, and that's such starting. But three days after Passover, anybody remember what the next feast was? Three days after Passover, what was that? First fruits. Yes, the feast of the first fruits, which is exactly the day Jesus rose, and he is the first fruits of the resurrection. Okay. Good. I just keep thinking mm -hmm. about the time. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but like he pulled Peter, Peter and John up on a hill and, and had um, that was Abraham with them. Moses, Good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Matthew. Yeah, the, what do you call it? The, uh, Mount of Transfiguration is what we're talking about. It's Peter, James, and John, and it was uh, Moses and Elijah. And, uh, and yes, so they were there, and that's remember that's when they saw Jesus in his glorified body, and that's when they were, you know, in awe of what's happening here because Jesus showed them uh, himself in his true glory in his glorified body. So that's what he looks like now. <laughs> but he was also wasn't also Abraham and Moses there. Elijah. It was Moses Elijah. and Elijah. And they and they were basically resurrected, didn't they? No, they didn't. They wouldn't have been resurrected bodies yet. They're they're still waiting for theirs. Everyone in heaven right now is waiting for their resurrected bodies. Right. It was because Jesus. when, so now go two years ago to our eschatology study. When do they? When does everyone get their resurrected body? The second coming. Yes, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. The day of the rapture. The second coming. God's rapture. wrath being poured upon. That is when we receive our resurrected bodies. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about it then at the last trumpet. Um, you know, and it'll change in a twinkling of an eye, but um, that that's when that will happen. Okay? So, were they, so they don't have one yet. He just, they just recognize them. They were just in the spirit, I guess, right? They were just in spirit yeah. form. Yep. But what was the whole thing about that? That was the glory, show. Right? I mean, they were all being like... Because they haven't met Jesus. They, they did not know Jesus, correct? That was part of the... Don't get us too far on the rabbit trail now. No, I'm saying, why would they... <laughs> Why did they, We're not in Matthew 17 tonight. Why, no. why, why did <laughs> no, they meet kidding. with Jesus again? Because they never met Jesus, right? I mean, that was part of it. They were there with Jesus. Well, they would have met Jesus because they died thousands of years before that in the Old Testament. Right. So they would have known him before he became a baby on earth. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. They would have been in heaven with him already. He goes, you know. So just let our minds totally go <laughs> boom on that one. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you know what I'm saying. So they definitely know Jesus. Yeah. But what was what, what what was the meeting for? Why why did why did it happen? I'm gonna hold what? you on that. We'll talk okay. about it after. It's too long of a too long of a trail. All right, no problem. Uh, we'll problem. talk about it later. It's a great question. Good thought. So, um, but let's get back to this. The whole point of that is the resurrection of the dead is a biblical truth. Like you were saying, it's it's a truth that some of them believe and some did not. Okay, and that, in fact, is the validation. That's why I bring it up. That's the validation of Jesus being the Messiah, and that's one of the points that Paul trying to make here, and he does in, in many other places. Okay, but Paul, remember this is now before he was converted, he was saying, I was doing these things, and now he says, so I thought I had to do hostile things to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Uh, not only did I lock many of them up, and notice it says, not, not only did I lock up many of the saints, okay, so remember there again, who are the saints? Believers. Believers. Okay, so those believing in this way, in this sect of Jesus, of the, of the Nazarene sect, that they would call it. Uh, I locked them up, but not only that, but receiving authority from the chief priests, 
when they were being put to death, I also cast my vote against them. Remember we talked about that, that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin council, that he was in fact in front of in chapter 23 as they were judging him. He used to be on the other side of that, Amen. throwing his vote, he said, against the Christians every time. That when they would vote and say, this guy's a blasphemer, he deserves to die, Paul said, yep, amen. Yep. Okay, so Paul's giving us his testimony there of, of putting his stamp of approval on, on killing of Christians. Okay. Also, I punished them all, I punished them in all the synagogues and tried to force them. I, I find that very interesting. And I tried to force them to blaspheme, and I pursued them in foreign cities. That's pretty, it's like, you know, you see those shows and you watch these recordings of like these, uh, you know, these cops in the room and they force, you know, they have these hostile interrogation methods and, uh, you know, they, they have coercive uh, testimonies and stuff that just are, are crazy. 28 hours, no food, and, you know, they're just getting people to confess to things that they didn't do. Uh, so I find it interesting. I, I bet his methods were a lot more brutal. Uh, than the cops you see on the video, but he's saying that I tried to force them to blaspheme. So listen to what in fact he's saying. Not only did I throw them in prison, and I had letters and all the authority from the chief priest to do so, but also every single one of them that came before the council, I said, uh, you know, to death with them, but also I would get them, I would en entice them to blaspheme. Why? Because then I can kill them. That's what they try to do to Jesus. Too, That's right. Trick. So that I, I that was be, Paul. Okay. He used waterboarding. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Maybe he did. Who knows? Right. You know. But look, that was Paul pre pre conversion, right? Unregenerate, uh, BC Paul, BC Saul, before Christ, um, right before conversion. But it doesn't say but. But I just feel there needs to be a but right there. But the story changes right here because he says, while I was so engaged, and I think that just, that word doesn't even encompass all of what he seemed to be. <laughs> Paul was much more than engaged, uh, probably more like obsessed. So while I was engaged and I was on my way to Damascus at midday, on the way I saw light, it knocked me on the ground. I heard a voice speak to me in Hebrew. So we review this testimony again. Uh, that we hear of, of his testimony during his uh, defense here. A voice said to me in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What chapter are we reviewing from right here? Good, chapter 9. And again, chapter 22, he gave the same exact testimony to all the Jews that were outside that were just beating him to death on the stairway. Um, he gave the same testimony too, and that's when he lost them all and they wanted to kill him again. Uh, because Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then I love this one. Always had this underline in every one of my Bibles. Uh, you should circle and underline it because it was the same for you. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks is what uh, King James says. K uh, kick against the goads is what I have here in the ESV. I think the NASB says goads as well. Um, anyone else can maybe explain for us what that means? What does that mean? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. That's what they used to use for the for the cattle, and like you're kicking into. It's just like if I hold a knife and you start stabbing yourself, you you know it's hard to do that, but you're doing it. You know, he's going against God's will. Yep, it's everybody understand what he's. What's going to happen, and you're going against what's going to happen, but it's inevitable. right. It's going to yeah, happen. Exactly. Right. That that's the goat. In fact, why right? was the thing to spur to spur the animal on, uh, like you said, and it would do something, and it would get that poke and that prod. Uh, to, to keep going and um, so that's what he's saying is you're kicking against the pricks um, and so you're not going to be able to continue on this track that you are on I'm in fact changing the path that you are on uh, you are no longer on your team you are now on my team you are no longer a slave to sin you are now my slave uh, you know, we can keep going on with the things that we talk about through Romans and, you know, all the, the discussions and Bible studies we're having on, on this area, uh, you know, and that we talk about with election and God's, you know, sovereignty and, and soteriology and salvation and all those things. But it's encompassed all in Saul's journey for sure. And if you don't see that that's in yours, 
I hope you do, because it should be revealed to you that you're the same exact way, and that's why it's underlined in my Bible. That's why I would tell you to underline it, highlight it, circle it in your Bible, because you were kicking against the pricks too, okay? And so thankfully, God knocked you off your horse and blinded you and opened your eyes and your ears to hear the gospel and saved you, and he saved me the same way he did Paul. And so uh, praise the Lord and, and thank you very much. So God changed his, his jersey here, if you will, will, and said, you're on this team now, and these are your marching orders, and this is what you will do. <laughs> and I will equip you for this. I'm getting ahead of myself. He says first, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. You can only imagine his, his demeanor at that moment. You know what I mean? And just like, just how he felt in that moment just has to be unbelievable. Uh, so get up, stand on your feet, uh, probably shut your mouth first, like pick your jaw up, uh, get off the ground, and let's get up and let's go, because this is the reason I have appeared to you. And again, it's the same reason that God appeared to you and he appeared to me, and he might not have done it in a in a in-person visit like he did with Paul, but he did it nonetheless the same exact way. And it's for the same exact reason, to appoint you as a minister and as a witness of the things you've seen and the things that I will appear to you. So he's already talking to him about future visits and future appearances and future revelations that Jesus is going to give to him. And we've already seen the last month we've been talking so much about the protection that he keeps doing. Uh, you're going to go to Jerusalem. Don't worry. He protects them. Don't worry. Go out in that city. I have people here. You're going to be fine. And the other guy gets beat up and he doesn't. Now he did get beat up and get stoned and all that. But, but when God said, I'm going to protect you, be strong and be courageous, he stood on it and he did it. He goes to Jerusalem. You're going to be fine. You got to go to Rome. So now he knows oh, I'm fine. Okay. To get to Rome. And we're going to see that he gets put to the test next chapter because next week I won't be here. And when you guys talk about it, uh, you know, it's going to be a whole long, crazy journey through a, a, a ship, two ships and a hurricane and a storm, and they get shipwrecked, and it's crazy. And yet he he assures and calms the entire ship full of people because he knows what? I'm it. getting to Rome. <laughs> this can't be it. <laughs> okay? So um, that's, that's what Paul had looking forward to and knowing that Jesus had a plan for him. And in chapter 9, we don't get the whole shot here. But remember that in chapter 9, he told him right off the bat that uh, I will show you what great things you must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, and now, yeah. fast forward, here we are in Acts, finding about all that suffering that he's doing for his name's sake. Okay? Yeah, God was honest but on both sides of it. <laughs> this leg's not going to be a good one. But the next one, I'll protect you. Like, he was, he yeah. Kind of told him, he was just honest with him about what was going to happen. Good. Either way. Good. Yeah, I'll be there regardless. So, so be strong, be courageous, and, and don't don't fear. Okay. Um, so he says to him, "I will rescue you from the Jews or from your people and the Gentiles to whom I am sending you." So he knows. He's telling right there, "I will rescue you from the Jews." What does that mean? That means the Jews are going to come after you. That means know what you're going about to do that I'm going to send you to do. They're going to hate you and they're going to try to persecute you. And didn't he tell his disciples the same thing? They hate me. They're going to hate you. And, and you know what? The servant gets what the master gets, and you're deserving of it and worthy of it. <laughs> that's it. You know, that's the message. Okay? So, again, he's foretelling Paul of his divine plan uh, of protection and to accomplish the purpose that he has set for uh, Paul in advance to do, as Ephesians 2.10 says. And look at what that purpose is. And again, same purpose for us, guys. To open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. Okay? Now, we don't do that. Paul didn't do that. God does that. Mm -hmm. But he sent Paul to be a conduit and a messenger to, for people to do that. He sends you and I as a messenger for people to do that. Why? Because this message right here that we're supposed to be embarking and being messengers for, this is the message that saves people. Right? Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 17. Hearing comes by what? Hearing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. This is the message. We are the messengers. Mm -hmm. And this is your uh, direction. This is your job. These are your marching orders. Okay? Same, same ones he got. Everybody's in a little different way, right? But as a believer... 
it's all the same job. It's all the same thing. Okay, from the dominion of Satan. Because remember, as a slave to sin, you are a slave to Satan. That's who you were. And now you're a slave to Christ and righteousness. That, for what purpose? Why are you doing that? That they may receive the forgiveness of sins. That they may have an inheritance with those who have been sanctified by faith in me. And that, that hits right here. I didn't even bring this verse up. But guys, there's our Romans Bible study right there. We're talking about sanctification. Um, and it's yes, it's a process. But it's also something that's already been done. There's two sides to the coin of sanctification. Do you see what that says? Those who have been sanctified. Past tense. Why? Because when you're saved, you've been justified and sanctified. But there's still the ongoing process of sanctification. But you've also, in another aspect, been sanctified already. Okay, by faith in Christ. So, he says to King Agrippa, and remember, to all the audience listening, but he's definitely taking, you know, aim at the captive audience of the king. And remember, the king is taking ear to him because he knows of Paul and of Jesus and all this, and he wants to hear of this and know what's happening. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Which is one way to say what? I was obedient. I did not prove disobedient because I was obedient to the heavenly vision, meaning I did those things. What he called me to do and sent me to do, I did to the best, best of my abilities. And man, if we can get to heaven and say that, that that's going to be huge. Okay? Um, I question myself. Uh, as well, but you look at this and I obeyed Paul says I did what he called me to do and told me to do Am I doing are you doing what God has called you to do? And what he the work he has set out before the foundation of the world for you Steve for you Jay For you Craig for you Brian to do are you doing that? Are you being obedient to what he wants you to do? Uh, that's called a gut check for the maturing believer in their sanctification process, okay? Um, so it hit me hard studying through this, and so I'm trying to uh, gut punch you with the same manner right now, okay? So uh, that's just some real-life application for us that we can find all through this. And again, that's really what I'm trying to get out of my own study time in this, and, and for you guys, I hope we pause on that enough to really hit it because... Again, we're just going through a narrative here, and it's kind of hard and difficult sometimes to be like, to stay attentive, you know? It's just, we can just read through this and be like, yeah, that's what happened. But where do we find application, and where do we find something that means, you know, the so what? You know what I mean? The so what does that mean for me? Well, here's the so what. There's so what's all over the place if we really look at it, and there's one right there, okay? Are we being obedient to the calling? Um, by which he has called us and doing the things that he has for us. Okay. And he says, in my being obedient, I kept declaring these things. I kept declaring all this at Damascus, also at Jerusalem. Got to flip my page here, sorry. So, where are we? <laughs> Verse 20. So I declare those things in Damascus, then Jerusalem, and then all throughout the region of Judea. Remember our map. Remember our timeline. That when he says, I said it at Damascus, then I saw Jerusalem. Remember after his conversion, about 34 AD, we said. For three years, remember, when we went back to Acts chapter 9, between those two verses there, we go to Galatians 1 and find that there's a three-year gap where he goes to Arabia and he is ministered to and, and is maturing in, in the Lord for three years before he goes to Jerusalem. Okay? So, and before he goes to Damascus. So there's a little bit of a three-year gap there that he's talking about right in between that. But after that, he goes to Damascus, he goes to Jerusalem, and he declares and preaches the gospel all throughout that time. And all throughout that region... And we know that it's the gospel because he says, I preach to the Jews and the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. Okay, so he is preaching the good news 
of the gospel and to repent and turn to Jesus uh, for the forgiveness of sins. And now he says, for this, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Remember who those Jews are. When he says, some Jews, we've got like several groups of Jews and several different categories of Jews. We have like uh, Jewish believers, right, that are now in the church. So we have Messianic Jews, we would call them nowadays, okay? So a Jew who's been converted and believes in Jesus as the Messiah, that now makes them a part of the church, okay? So uh, then we have these Jews, like the Jewish relig religious leaders. Then we have these other Jews who are also in other nations because the Jews we're talking about that he's referring to are the Jews from Asia. Back in chapter 21, we find it said Jews from Asia were the ones that said, we saw him bring Trophimus, the Gentile, into the temple. And it was Jews from Asia that did that. So we have these Jews who, remember, spread abroad all over the place. Macedonia, Greece, you know, Galatia. There's Jews in the synagogues. Remember, he would always go to the synagogue first, to the Jew first. Um, those guys came to the temple for the, for the festival because, remember, that's why they were there from Asia. Because, remember, just as Paul wanted to get at the end of that trip to Jerusalem for Pentecost... The Jews from Asia are in town and in the temple for Pentecost. And now they're saying, there's the guy, let's get him. And this is what he was doing. And, and, and uh, Trophimus, the Gentile believer, was there for the same reason. And we saw him and he did this. And just on and on and on with unpacking the story and what actually happened there. Those are the Jews that he's referring to when he says, some Jews said this about me. Uh, and remember he told the last guy, he said, they should be here. Remember that? He said to Felix, he said, the Jews that accuse me aren't even these guys. The Jews that accuse me, you don't even have here. They should be here accusing me of what they said they, they were doing. They're not even here. Okay, so um, that's what he's pointing out to him. And so he continues this, this again, recapping this narrative of what's already happened. Um, so really, Paul's given like the biggest Craig review, Brian, you could ever you could ever find right here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's where he came back to, right? At the, like, the end. He kept dodging that area, right? That was like yeah, yeah, the back. third. Right. So he went back, and then, yeah, he was up in Philippi, it said, for uh, Passover and Love and Bread. Remember, he said he wanted to get back to Jerusalem for Pentecost, remember? And so he went quickly around and, and uh, Ephesus, remember, because it, it would detract him too much. He went to Miletus and had the Ephesian elders, remember, from the church come, and they met, and then he left. Um, yeah, that's exactly. So those were the, the latest Jews that he stirred up yeah. right before he got back, right? Pretty much. Exactly. Exactly. And they did. Remember how you're, you're point, making a great point. That's how they followed him everywhere. Remember the ones that, that stoned him on the first trip in Lystra were the ones from Iconium and Pisidian Antioch, the two cities he just came from. They just followed him and found him. And we saw that a couple different times. That's right. Good. This part's awesome. So having obtained help from God. <laughs> so uh, and the ESV says, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And I don't even need to say anymore because we've already said plenty on that. We've seen the divine intervention and protection that God has given to Paul all throughout this, this time. I stand here today because God protected me, testifying, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would happen. So he's like, the Old Testament, and, and guys, understand that's what he's saying. What is he saying when he, when he says the prophets and Moses? Because the prophets wrote scriptures, right? And who would have been credited to writing what they would hold as the highest scriptures? The Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, okay? So that's what he's saying. That's what Jesus meant when he said, everything we've written by Moses and the prophets speak about me, you know? Uh, that's what we're talking about. So he's saying to the Jews, yeah, those scriptures that you guys hold so dear to, uh, I'm saying exactly what they say. And you're having a problem with me, but I'm just telling you what you know those scriptures say. That the Christ would suffer. And by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. As that, that message has never changed. It's been there from the beginning. It's just that the Jews did not recognize it and they did not do it. They did not act on it. And I dare say the church today isn't acting upon it either, how we should be. But the Jews were just, you know, 
they were putting their light under the bushel. They weren't going out and being a light to all the other nations like they were told to do. Okay, so they didn't do that. And, and he's saying that Christ would suffer, he was resurrected, these are the things that would happen, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. And that's all I'm telling you, that it's been fulfilled. <laughs> and now, verse 24, as he was saying these things in his defense, so he's talking, and Festus just has a bust up and like interrupt, you know what I mean? And the as he was speaking those things, actually... Uh, Brian and I were talking a little earlier, and you brought up Job, but that's what just hit me when that, when you read that, as he was saying these things, because that's what happened with Job. It was like, as the one servant was saying, this just happened, another servant came up before he even finished and said, oh, well, this happened. And then as he was talking, the next one came up and said, I'm the only one that escaped, if you remember Job. It's, I'm the only one that made it, and, and man, the cattle and everything's gone. And as he's talking, the next one comes, the next one comes, uh, just worse news, worse news, worse news, your family's dead, just on and on and on. Um, and so, as he's speaking, Festus just can't even contain himself anymore. And he up, jumps up and yells with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. And your great learning is driving you mad. Essentially, you're insane. Uh, the things that you're saying, think about who Festus is now. Mm -hmm. The new guy, not familiar with Jewish customs, not familiar with the way, with Jesus and with Paul and the apostles and things that have been happening the last 30 years as Felix was, as Agrippa is, as the Jews are, this is just like, what are you guys talking about? Uh, you know, this, this is nonsense. This is crazy. Um, you're, you're out of your mind. Uh, and the great learning has driven you out of your mind. So uh, this, this quest for knowledge, you're a smart guy, Paul, and, and I've really enjoyed you up to this point, but what, what's wrong with you, bro? You know? But I like 26, what he tells me in 26. I think that is so cool. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'm not out of my mind. Most excellent Festus. <laughs> but I utter words of sober truth, is what the Nazbe say. I like it. I utter words of sober truth. Because why? I'm going to speak confidently. I'm going to be boldly. Why? Because the king knows about these things. Amen. <laughs> the king that I'm talking to right now is my, my main audience. I already spoke to you. You know. Uh, Everybody else is here, but yeah. I'm talking to this guy for whatever purpose that is. And we kind of unpacked a little bit what that purpose might have been, okay, uh, for, for later on, 10 more years, 12 more years or so from now. Uh, the king knows these things, so I'm speaking confident to him that none of these things have escaped his notice. Mm -hmm. And this is underlined in your Bible, too. This has not been done in a corner. Dude, right. this is no secret, man. Amen. This is just like yesterday when I was speaking, uh, preached yesterday and said, you know, Jesus wasn't hiding the fact that he was the son of God. He never didn't deny, he never denied that and he never didn't claim that. Uh, this isn't a secret thing that's happening. Uh, we can talk about the encoded message and all that other stuff, but this was no secret. All these things were uh, being unfolded in public. He knows, everyone in this area knows. I know you're new Festus from Rome and from Italy and you've been imported here recently. But everyone knows this, right? It's going on in the open eye of the public. Unless you're blind. As, yeah. as, I, that's why I said, except as for as that part. <laughs> um, good, good. For this has not been done in a corner. Now I love this. Because here's Paul. As he says, I'm going to speak boldly. He says in the next sentence, the next verse. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know, you do. I know that you do. <laughs> cool. It's way cool because look, follow this. Yeah. Paul is being way more than bold here. I want you. I want us to, to not miss this. I miss this. Thank, yeah, thank the Lord for good commentators and voice. trustworthy uh, teachers that I can learn from. If he says no, right? If if he says do you believe the prophets, King Agrippa? <laughs> and he says no, then mm. the Jews are going to hate him. And the right. Jews are going to be mad. Because they're like, what are you talking about? Like, it's the prophets. It's God's prophets. Of course we believe them. Of course you believe them. So he can't say no. But now if he says yes, he's still in the same predicament, really. Because the Jews are going to get angry because what's Paul going to do with that? Paul's going to turn that into showing him how Christ is the Messiah through the prophets. Do you see it? 
It's like brilliant. It's like he put him right on the spot and said, here you go. Here's your moment of truth. Uh, and so it kind of sparks Herod's reaction because he doesn't give an answer. Because he can't say yes or no. Because it's going to go down one of these two paths either way. Because Paul's not going to stop. If he says yes, Paul's not going to stop trying to convince him. Good, you do believe the prophets. You believe all the stuff I'm saying about the Messiah. He's been resurrected. Jesus said he was the one. You know, on and on and on and on to plead his case to say this is the Messiah. This is what they were talking about. Okay, so that prompts him to say this. And we'll talk about this maybe for the rest of our time. Uh... Most of the rest of our time. And Agrippa said to Paul, so here's his answer. In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? So, two thoughts on this. You've probably heard the first one, which I heard most of the time. Uh, for most of the years that I've read or studied or anything in Acts here. But you can read this, and, and most people, probably I would say most, would teach uh, that he's saying, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Like kind of like in jest, you know, like pff, you think with this little effort that you're giving, I'm going to be a Christian. You're like you think I'm going to become like you, you know what I mean? And believe in this sect and this thing that uh, everybody hates. It's the opposite. You, well, I, I tend to think so. I think you should read it. And that's why I put this big or Read it the, the way it is. And when you go back, um, the NASB is kind of, uh, I think, the closest to what the original intent is that I was looking at. It says, you nearly persuade me to be a Christian. That's how it reads. Yeah, that means it that says, means. you nearly persuade me to be a Christian. He's, in fact, saying in this that kind of, in this short time, you are persuading me. Yeah, you are that's, influencing me. It's kind of how a lot of people say he's saying it the other way. Like, you're not getting to me, dude. Like, this ain't happening. Um, I don't I don't see that. Pete. I mean, no King James is saying you almost. Yeah, one of them says you almost yeah. persuade me. And, and that's right. And people will say in that sense. So, uh, but, you know, regardless, uh, it definitely prompts Paul's response here. Uh, and with knowing what we know, about what I shared with you, Agrippa's willingness to allow the church safe voyage and and staying in his area after the city was destroyed. And he said, you guys can come and be living here and not be persecuted under me. Uh, seems to, to hold light the other way. Uh, that, that you do almost, as Pete said, persuade me. Uh, you know, that, that there is something there that I'm okay with you. You know, that I'm more than, like, okay with you. Like, I'm open to, to you, and that's well, fine. <laughs> one guy was blind, Festus, and I think God opened the eyes of Agrippa and the ears at that moment there as far as the short time that Paul was talking, was talking the truth, because that's what he's talking the truth. So the other guy saying, man, you're mad, you're going crazy, but the other guy <laughs> saying, you know what? For a small, small time, I, you know, I, I, that's my personal belief. That's why I, I would take it that God opened his eyes. And who knows, to what degree? Now, to the degree of salvation, I don't I don't know if that's a salvific opening no, up his I, eyes or if it's just, you know what, making it enough to use him later. Because same thing with Cyrus. Daniel, Daniel, read through Daniel, read through the Old Testament. You know, you'll see that, that Darius and uh, the Mede and also Cyrus the Persian and these guys, they loved Daniel. You know what I mean? They loved Daniel, uh, and, and they they thought highly of him, but they weren't believers, uh, you know, to to our knowledge. Um, so yeah, he def God can definitely give, you know, give Paul a, a good look. Uh, That's what I him. see there. That's so. what I see that he would. It was just for that king right there. That king was at the right time at the right place. Good. And maybe ten years down the line, God opened his eyes and his ears there. And, Eleven years. And, well, yeah. He, yeah. Well, yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Between that time and, and, and when the give or take, ship, right on ship. our timeline, yeah, right. say 10 12 <laughs> years, yeah, good. So, um, yeah. And, and again, this prompts though, look at look at Paul's response. <laughs> he said, Agrippa, whether it be short or long time, not only to you, but all who hear me today, I wish would become as I am. Mm -hmm. And then he says, except for these chains. And you get his picture, him holding up his arms, 
chained to a guard here, to a guard here. You know, except for this that I'm going through, uh, I wish you all would be like me. And I don't care if it's in the short time you're allowing me now or if you allow me to stay here for two more years and bring me before you every day. Uh, I hope you would all be as I am. So obviously we understand that's not a very encrypted message there, that, that Paul's desire is that God saves them. <laughs> Paul's desire is that people come to uh, believing by faith in Jesus Christ and, and the message that Paul has just given them, right? So they are in the line of fire, if you want to say, to be saved now, right? Because if faith comes by hearing and hear the word of God, God primarily... Well, they just heard the word of God. Paul just gave them the gospel. He just gave all of them the gospel that Jesus is the Messiah from the prophets and Moses and on and on and on. So now, if God wants to open a heart here and you guys can be saved, then Paul's saying with his chains, glory to God. Like, that's fine with me. I hope it happens. Uh, you know, I want it to happen for everyone here. And that, again, application for us, that should be our desires as believers. You know, every time we speak and preach and teach uh, to, to people that don't know Jesus as Lord, uh, that needs to be what we want to be happening. So, it definitely good. sounds like, I mean, just at first glance, first time you read through it, that's what it sounded like to me. Like, he was basically saying, like, very convincing in your argument. Like, you, you almost got me believing right. it. Yeah. Like, right. you know what I mean? Not that good. maybe he was saved, but just... Yeah, and I mean, hey, we'll know one day. He was listening yeah. to him. He was, he was definitely listening to him. We'll know one day. Either, like, way, okay, either, way, okay, either way, we know God made him receptive to what he wanted him to be receptive to, to use him to accomplish his will and move the ball down the field. Okay? Um, yeah, that's right. A big deal considering the condition of his family. You know, like, <laughs> traditionally, you know, that's anti -Jesus. Exactly right. Well, exactly. The thing is, too, even if you don't believe somebody like Paul, like, you got to, like, almost respect this Admire. guy's, like, I mean, yeah. it's just like, Dude, it's like, man, how's this fearless. guy do this? I mean, he just, he's in chains. He don't care. He just does not care. Which is <laughs> why Festus like... calls him mad. Because everyone else is just thinking, man, this Paul is just so relentless yeah. and dedicated and serious about this. From an outsider look in, it's like, dude, this guy is crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? This guy's does, obsessed with this thing. He instantly comes back <laughs> after being called crazy. That's cool, too. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm not going to leave that hanging there. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get through these last couple of verses, guys. Now the king, <clears throat> so Agrippa, Festus, Bernice. Remember who, who's Bernice? Wife, Good. Yeah, Jordan. Agrippa's sister, Agrippa the second's sister and wife, daughter of Agrippa, their dad. Uh, so they gather together. They have their little conference, their little debrief after the, uh, the message here by Paul. And, uh, and they say, look, man, this guy's done nothing worthy of death. He's done nothing worthy of imprisonment. And so we see again that the consensus of the Roman authorities is that he has violated no Roman law. Remember, that's what they're, that's what they care about. They don't care about the Jewish things. Okay, so he's violated no Roman law. Uh, same conclusion that Lysias came to, same that Felix came to, same that Festus comes to. It's the same that Agrippa comes to. The difference here too, though, I want us to recognize is Agrippa, look at the last the last verse. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Because now, it's a little different. The prior ones we talked about are all Roman officials saying he didn't violate Roman law. Agrippa is now understanding those things, but he's a king of the Jews. He knows Jewish ways and says, this guy's done nothing against the Jewish ways and the Jewish customs, in my view, as the king. Uh, and so he could be um, released even from that, if he didn't appeal to Caesar. Because obviously... Like he has an appointment with Caesar, so he's got to go That's that. what I mean. Even though, because yeah. that's why all this that's is kind of pointless. That question you had at before. Yeah. He's so going to Caesar no matter what. no charge, because he already asked for it, so he's going to, you know... Well, what if the king released him, and then they still murdered him? Would they be charged? Like, well, exactly. Exactly. And that's, and that's exactly why he wasn't going to not go to Caesar, because that was obviously God's way of protecting him. It's it's God's, God's rule, of it's certainly that's where he's got to go. Right. Cool. Yeah, and we know they would have because remember the over 40 that made the fasting vow pledge uh, thing <laughs> and then after that remember the the council the Sanhedrin uh, when remember when Festus came as new governor he was in Jerusalem and remember the council said to him oh 
Paul's up there. Why don't you go get him and bring him to be tried here? And it said that they were going to kill him on his way. Yeah, you know I mean, so exactly. If if Agrippa had authority could, and it could have released him, could all this have happened so Agrippa was there to listen to the message and in nine or eleven years? That's what I'm the saying. Church, you know, and that was that yeah. was God's only purpose. I mean, I mean, not only purpose. I mean, what I mean purpose was this guy. You're going to talk and he's going to hear you. And in eleven years or nine years, he's going to. I say, find it very interesting. Interestingly, heavily weighted that way. It, I, like you said, when you recorrected, you said it's not the only reason, but certainly it was instrumental in any kind of decisions later that Agrippa made to be helpful to the people that Paul was. And remember, Paul Paul wouldn't be there. Paul's not going to be in that church. He's right. going to die uh, in 66. So we're a couple you? years out from Paul's death. 66? Yeah, like 66. And so it's still a good four or five years after Paul's death that that happens. But, you know, Paul's made such a impression on Agrippa, you know, and perhaps, I mean, like we said, we're That's only true. following this one timeline. So Agrippa's going to meet many other Christians, uh, you know, where he's at, especially being in Caesarea and Herod's Praetorium and all that. Remember how we talked about, uh, you know, that there's believers there, that uh, one of the seven, remember, that we talked about is there. <laughs> Philip, the evangelist, remember, is there in Caesarea. Also... Uh, I'm blanking, the, the Italian um, soldier, Cornelius, Cornelius from chapter 10, you know what I mean, there's even Roman cohorts and Roman soldiers who are converted mm -hmm. now, uh, you know what I mean, so Paul's definitely instrumental in that, but there's others who are going to be leading in the next 10, 12 years instrumental in, uh, in influencing Agrippa to where God wants him to be at that time. Good, awesome stuff, amen indeed. Great night, guys. Thank you. Too.